Bernard Henri Lavie is a French public intellectual, media personality, and author. He frequently writes about anti Semitism, democracy, and human rights. For the past two years in France and in Europe, he has strongly advocated for Ukraine, meeting with their government, including President Poroshenko, on several occasions. Last year, Lévy also wrote a play, Hotel Europe, about the events of the Euromaidan. We are very proud to welcome Bernard Andre Lévy to our conference today. It's with great pleasure we give you the floor now. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So, the title which has been uh, proposed for these uh, open these remarks is our. Ukraine is the sentinel of Europe. I would like to develop what I mean by this, um, this formula. Saying that Ukraine is a sentinel of Europe means, first of all, that there is something like a war going on. If you need a sentinel, it means that you have at least a conflict or a situation of pre-war which, in my opinion, is the case. Russia, the Russia of, of Vladimir Putin is a great country with a great culture, but one cannot deny with all goodwill and all reasonable point of view that there is a situation which is not a situation of peace. When a country decides to change the borders on which the security of Europe is built. When he decided to break the treaties which make the, the key on the architecture of Europe, it is an act of war. When the president of this country commissions a group of MPs in the Russian parliament in order to study, I quote, the legality of the independence of the Baltic countries, which happened last July. It is at least a threat, if not more. When the president of this country, I quote again, Vladimir Putin is reported to have said, reported by the Sudaiche Zeitung, which is a very serious newspaper, when he is reported to have said that it would take to his new army no more than two days to reach Varsov, to arrive to Varsov. It is not an act of peace. It is at least a threat, and in the new codes of the post-Cold War Europe, it might be a bellicist and a strong bellicist act. When you can count the nearly impossible to the countless violations of the um, airspace by um, Russian planes since the last year, 152, I think, violations which uh, give place sometimes to excuses, sometimes no, again. And you know, you know that in this country and in this part of Europe, you cannot say that it is a normal situation of a normal partnership in the world which we thought had been built after the Second World War and in the world which we thought had taken birth after the, the fall of the, of the wall of Berlin. All these declarations, all these acts, also the declaration, the recent one, of Vladimir Putin saying that he had nothing to say at the end of the day against 
the Molotov-Ribbentrop Agreement, which, as you well know, had as a main consequence the invasion of Eastern Europe, again, it is not an act of peace. So there is a situation of a new Cold War, soft war, which is not without causes. One who observes carefully and scrutinizes the state of the debate in Moscow and in Russia well knows that there is a real pattern of ideas which is taking shape in Russia, which is not only um, renewal of old imperialism or relinking with old Russia, which is more than that. There is a true ideology based on the idea of Eurasia, opposition between the supposed weak and feminized Europe and the strong, uh, uh, virile um, Russia. There is a lot of stuff written by partners, friends, ideologists of the Kremlin opposing the thalassocracy of European countries, Norway being often quoted as one of them, and the teleurocracy, the reign of infinite earth, which is the qualification of Russia. There is today in Moscow a real idea, maybe an intention, maybe a plan of taking revenge. This is, all this is facts. Taking revenge on what Vladimir Putin has often said, that it was, in his eyes, the biggest catastrophe of the 20th century, which is the decay and the fall and the collapse of Soviet Union. There is this idea of taking revenge on this, of this collapse. There is the idea that Europe is one of the responsible, maybe the, maybe the most important, or at least the most reachable of this collapse. And objectively, without any spirit of polemic, what cannot avoid to conclude that there is today some people some women and men, including the president himself, who believe that this revenge on Europe is a task and a duty. This is the situation. The second aspect of the situation is that in front of that, the least we can say is that Europe in general, Europe as itself and each of the countries of our continent do not react in the good way. Listen, since one year and a half, what we heard about the annexion of Crimea. Since I can, I can understand relation of power, I can understand that chief of state have to keep cold blood. But how strange it is that since the first day, since the first minute, so many voices and vocal voices expressed themselves in order to say that there was nothing to say against the annexion of Crimea. That at the end of the day, Crimea always belonged to Russia. That there is, a, I don't know which, fatality of geography or history, which make that a people has to belong to this space of influence and not this one. There was not the slightest will to resist politically, I don't even speak of militarily, but politically and even ideologically against this incredible act, completely new in the new world of the post-Berlin Wall fall, 
which happened in Crimea. The argument of Putin and of the Putinists, of the new musketeers, musketeers, which is the linguistic nationalism, the idea that Russia is where Russian is spoken. This idea, which is one of the cores of the Russian narrative. We know that this argument is, number one, stupid. We know that it is, number two, very dangerous, because if we follow it, I don't know any border of Europe which is safe. But we know also that the one who launched it in the public discussion 70 years, uh, 80 years ago was Adolf Hitler. We know that, that it is the, in the name of the same argument. Germany is, stands exactly everywhere where German language is, is spoken. It was one of the key points of the Nazi ideology. Who said it? Who among the big responsible politis, political, intellectual, journalist responsible, who said that in a very vocal way? Who said in a strong way that we cannot build Europe, that we are debuilding it, if we accept to enter even one finger in this idea of apparent common sense that the language is the basis of the nation. I know in France, in my country, very prominent statesmen, some who are my friends, some whom I respect, who said immediately again since the first day that they understood this logic. And this was a real shame. So Europe did not behave as it should have. Europe did not react as she should have react. Europe said in front of each of Putin provocation as a, as a motto, as a light motive, as a loop, an, inter, an eternal loop, dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. After Crimea, after violations of um, the Minsk uh, Agreement 1 and 2, when Debalcevo was heavily bombed in um, uh, uh, contrary to all agreements which have been signed by Putin, Europe kept repeating, and the world and America, dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. When you have um, a violent state on one side, who dares more and more, who tests and checks the resistance of the adversary, and when he only hears dialogue, 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 it is not an invitation to stop, it is an encouragement to continue. I must add that Putin has, in this Europe which he threatens, by all the ways I said, he has some allies, strong, prominent, and vocal allies. I don't want to make some comparisons because these sort of comparisons are never correct. And this one in particular, we have to be very careful with it. I quoted Hitler once. I don't dare to quote a second time, but nevertheless, remember the 30s. There was a threat outside Europe, and you, there was some um, representance of the threat inside, in every country, in every European country, even in, 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 in England. You have some parties, you had some leaders who were the, the, the relays, who were the the supporters of the threat of outside. 
It was the fascist parties. Today, we have all over Europe some parties who convey the message of Putin, who accept to, to, to build some fake committees of watching fake elections in Crimea or elsewhere, who go to Donbass, who go to Luhansk or Donetsk to see that there is nothing to see and that they did not see anything, like in Hiroshima, in the Marguerite Duras movie. Those are again the same. The extreme right parties all over Europe. I know it in my country. We have a, a, a party, National Front, who is literally paid by Russia, by the Kremlin, by banks linked to the Kremlin. But this could be said of most of the European countries, there is a column of allies of Putin who are involved in this plan of destabilizing, of threatening, of revenging on Europe. This is the situation of the continent. On one side, Russia, a strong ideology, a strong will, on the other side, Europe, a weak will, a situation of strange demoralization and the strange feeling which we have that Europe believes so little in itself and in its own values. The best defense against a political threat has never been only armies, but it is ideas, it is values. And in front of this situation, one can wonder if the values of Europe, on which Europe is built, are still alive or alive enough to protect the continent and to oppose the threat. This is my second point. And I come to the third one, which is the most important. There is one place in Europe when there is this will to oppose, where there is this uh, uh, will to resist, where there is no fear, or at least not so much fear, of Putin and of his will of uh, power. And this country is Ukraine. I was on the Maidan in February 2014, I won twice. I had the great honor to have spoken to the people of the Maidan, to have held for a few minutes the stage. I had the great honor to meet the, I would not say the leaders of the Maidan, there was no leaders, but the people of the Maidan. And they gave to me such an example of strength, of courage, and of spirit of resistance. We were afraid of Putin. They were not afraid of Putin. And even when the guys of Putin, the militias of Yanukovych, shot in the crowd, even when they sent to the sky la centurie celeste, the celeste century, these hundred and something young girls and boys whose only crime had to have hold against the heart the flag of Europe in which we do not believe any longer when they were sh shot, they opposed the killers, their bare breast. These are real Sentinels. I was in Kramatorsk with President Poroshenko. I went to uh, close to Dabaltsevo at the most critical time. Again, what I saw, contrary to the narrative of Russia, which is so often retaken by Europe, is not victims. It was not a defeated army, even in the Balsevo. 
It was not a defeated army. It was an army, it was some battalions of resistance, of defenders. They were heroes. Strange army, the army in Ukraine. People who are not so young, sometimes uh, my age, old soldiers, not always very professional, at least in the beginning, but who became the time coming because of their moral standards and moral values, great defenders of their country and of the continent. Great. I saw in Debalcevo, I saw in Kramatorsk real sentinels of Europe. But not only soldiers, the people of Kiev, the people, people of Lviv today, who are facing so many difficulties, who are facing at the same time, this has to be stressed, war and reforms. And reforms are very, it's very good on the long term, but it is very harmful on the short terms for people. The people of Kiev or Lviv of Ukraine in general faces the two situations again with such a cold blood, with such a bravery. They know that this has to be done, that the economy, politics has to be reformed at the same time as they have to defend their country. Again, this is acting as a strong and a heavy sentinel. Not only the civilian, not only the militaries. There is a man in Ukraine, a man whom I met on the Maidan. I did not know who he was. I never saw his face. We just happened to be close to each other and we spoke one after the other. This man was a businessman at this time, a great speaker and a businessman. His name is Petro Poroshenko. Petro Poroshenko, few men were so little shaped in order to make war. He was not done for that. He was not built, he was not um, um, trained for that at all. And as often in history, he did it very quickly, so well. And today, as Václav Havel in Czechoslovakia, as Lech Walesa 30 years ago in Poland, as so many others who were not trained to make war, who do it, who make it without loving it unwillingly, he does it in such a great way. Petro Poroshenko today is one of the sentinels of Europe. He does, he does the job which European leaders so often do not do. I was with him in Kramatorsk. I, was, I, I escorted him to the office of the French president before his election and then to the Normandy beaches one year ago. I know a little this man. I respect him a lot. I hope to be his friend. He is again a great sentinel. And as his militaries, as the civilian people of Kiev, as the, 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 the Maidan young people, he is doing the job of um, uh, um, saving and protecting Europe. And I must add, I just said that in Europe, the values and spirit of Europe is on a very low level that we no longer believe in our own values. These values are so living, so vibrant in Ukraine. Ukraine today, and this means is the real and deep meaning of being a sentinel. Ukraine believes in the value in which us Europeans believe so little or in such a shy way. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Minister, 
my friend of Norway. That's why we have such a task, such a duty of helping Ukraine. If we help Ukraine, we help the people of Ukraine, but we help yourself. We help and we protect our own border. If the Ukrainians are really the sentinels I just described of a Europe which is so unhealthy and unbelieving in itself, by defending Ukraine, we defend ourselves. We do it already. I heard the minister, your minister of foreign affairs, who did a great speech this morning, and I know that Norway is at the front line of this help to Ukraine. My country, at least the president of my country, does not act so badly also when he decided, for example, not to deliver the warships Mistral to Putin. He was very criticized for this act, but it was a brave act. It was a, an act of courage and honor and opposite to what it has been said. It was an act of real strong statesman. But this is not enough. If Ukraine is our sentinel, we have to do a lot more. We have to act to help economically. One year ago, one year and a half ago, I launched the idea of a Marshall Plan to Ukraine. And I noticed, I'm not an economist at all, that to build a Marshall Plan for Ukraine would cost much less than helping Greece to recover and to stay in Europe. To help Ukraine to, to, to do the same path as Poland or East Germany did 20 years ago would cost one third of what has already costed the necessary and good help to Greece. I launched this idea. I, I launched another one, which I would like to repeat here. Why not conceive? Why should we not, should you not launch the idea of a real, massive European loan to Ukraine? Let's imagine that the great, the big, international financial institution, the BIRD, the IMF, the World Bank. Let's imagine that they give their signature, their guarantee to a grassroots loan, to a citizen loan, to bonds of loan, uh, uh, bought by Every citizen of Europe who feels concerned by the fate of these sentinels. Every citizen who believes that it is his belief and his interest to support these sentinels by subscribing a bond. A European loan for Ukraine would be a great act of support would be a way to show to the bellicists of Kremlin that they cannot do anything, that they are not allowed to act in Europe as uh, hooligans. This is the, the task we have to do. We have to multiply also the political and intellectual links with this sentinel, which is Ukraine. And when I was walking here with my friend Gabi Gleishman, I had this thought, and I will finish with, the, with that. I was having this thought, in the new world where we are, which is so different than the world in which I grew. I grew in the world of the bipolar uh, world, uh, Soviet Union, America, America acting at the big cop of the world, the peace of the world being in the hands of a superpower. This was the world of yesterday. 
you had one super power which has, who had the responsibility of opening the threats on peace. Today, we face a very different situation. I was two, a few weeks ago in Israel, and I was yesterday in Kurdistan. Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan. Yesterday, I came just last night. And the idea came to me when I was walking in this beautiful Oslo, that in this new world in which we have entered, it happens that the fate of the world, the peacekeeping task, the responsibility to defend the world is in the hands no longer of a superpower, but in the hands of little powers, of little countries, big by the great by the spirit, but little small by the geography and sometimes weak by the economy. Kurdistan is our line of defense against ISIS, Daesh. Israel is the line of defense of civilization and of democracy against Hezbollah, Hamas, and so on. In the same sense, as the third summit of a blessed triangle, I would say that another small country, which is Ukraine, has the responsibility in its hands to do the job which was devoted before in the old ages to superpower, this little power is the third one to have the responsibility of holding the line. We have the duty to help the Ukrainians to help us, to help them to hold the line. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>